Now, Mike, compare that for us to NCCN. So my understanding also is that NCCN, NCCN really comes out to be more of a consensus statement. More than you know, more than evidence-based. It's more consensus, but they also have specific categories of how of how they look at their evidence. Correct. That's correct. So NCCN guidelines really are about putting together all of the different trials that are available and all different level of evidence, and then uh, coming up with a consensus statement as to what would be a recommendation. For those in which there are multinational, multi-institutional randomized controlled trials, which would be the highest level of evidence, there is oftentimes uniform consensus. And so that would be their level one category of evidence. Whereas where you have a 2A and 2B, the difference here is just the amount of evidence. So there may be smaller studies. But in their opinion, it may or may not be the best treatment. And then level three, of course, there's really diffuse opinion. No one knows what to do in those particular situations. For at least the prostate cancer guidelines, it's uh, an advanced setting. All of, the, uh, all of the data is at least 2A, which means there's a uniform consensus on it as far as being appropriate. But uh, there's several categories, of course, that we'll go through later in terms of multiple randomized controlled trials giving level one evidence uh, for using specific treatments in specific situations. So can you want to, so <clears throat> the NCCN, their guidelines really for a lot of people are, are much simpler to use. I think we have heard some dissenting statements that, that people, what they don't necessarily like about the AUA guidelines is having to pigeonhole into these six index patients. So how does NCCN lay theirs out? You know, I, I, we tend to use NCCN a little bit more. I mean, I think the AUA guidelines were, were excellent, but you're right, there's kind of a pigeonholing that goes through with that. And so, you know, in our advanced prostate cancer um, clinics, we tend to follow the NCCN guidelines because it gives you kind of a, a tree to follow depending on how the patient progresses throughout the timeline. Uh, so it's been easier, and it's also, I think, a good tool to teach the residents as well. Right. And, and again, we're going we're gonna to be talking about this extensively. The, I think a lot of people in, especially in large community practices and independent practices, what they like is the, is the bifurcation nature, if you will of how NCCN says you either have M0, M1, you do this. You're either symptomatic or asymptomatic and you do this. So Dr. Cheatham, so at Winthrop, because again, I think the academic institutions and integrated systems function a little bit differently, do you guys have a particular preference in terms of AUA versus NCCN? I mean, I think in managing patients clinically, the key here is to fully evaluate the patient and I think the AUA guidelines are very helpful in that it helps clinicians to identify what these patients are falling into. I think the key with managing these patients, we, we all know that many of these patients were diagnosed many years ago and they need proper evaluation to determine what the best treatment is for their metastatic disease. So I think it, it's an obvious point to make but these patients need to be properly evaluated from the beginning, full history, reviewing their previous medical care, proper clinical examination, early staging, regular restaging. I think in terms of the guidelines, it's, it, there's no one size fits all for any institution. I think it's important to have good collaboration both with urologists and medical oncologists. I personally find the AUA guidelines helpful to remember to think about whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, whether they've had dose attacks all before or not, and also to assess the patient's performance status. And the patient's performance status, I categorize in my head as their performance status overall, their general status, and also for patients with metastatic disease, many of them are in a perform poorer performance status because of the disease. And that doesn't necessarily mean they should be excluded from treatments because often, for example, many patients can have poor performance status prior to getting docetaxel, but often the treatment can improve their performance status when the disease is back under control. No, I think your points are well taken. I, I think urologists in general, and I, I'd like to get Dr. Sartor's opinion here next, is because I think we as surgeons, we're, we're so used to just operating and not all the time. I, I think we do obviously take performance status into play, but usually for us it's can they withstand an operation, you know, you know, as opposed to all the things that the medical oncology world has always looked at in terms of 
ECOG performance. So Oliver, you've been so you've been doing prostate cancer work for many, many years, and obviously you're recognized later. Are, are the, have the guidelines, do you think, helped in terms of managing these patients and getting the urology world more plugged into the serious nature of how these patients are doing and, and, and the need for early identification? Guidelines have been very helpful. But at the same time, there are limits, and there are a number of unmet needs that I think the guidelines do not address. You know, just as a, for instance, when we look at patients who may have been treated with docetaxel and then have progression, it turns out there are multiple trials that provide level one evidence. We could either use cabazitaxel, we could use enzalutamide, we could use abiraterone in the post-docetaxel progressive prostate cancer. So the guidelines, although really terrific and able to kind of pigeonhole the disease states that people are in, are nevertheless pretty limiting, and the reason, of course, is we simply don't have all the data that we need. So there's a lot of artistic interpretation, if you will, and a lot of ways to sort of look at the guidelines that we can sort of raise a little eyebrow when we see certain things, for instance, in the NCCN guidelines that are not level one evidence listed kind of alongside the level one evidence. So uh, the guidelines are great, they're very helpful, but they're not complete in truth. So when you work with your fellows, I mean, I, I'm assuming that basically it is, it is really, this is how it should be done and understanding these unmet needs, understanding the limitations, I think is very important. I think that's really the thing that's probably missing in the urology training programs is that the urology residents and fellows aren't really getting exposed to these guidelines because of the sort of segregation, if you will, in the academic centers. Do you, do you have urology residents or fellows that work jointly in your advanced clinics? We, we have a multidisciplinary clinic, and I'm actually in the urology clinic along with the fellows and residents there. And it's sort of a case-by-case -case teaching process. It turns out that there's an awful lot to learn, and it's evolving so quickly. I think one of the reasons that we're here, quite frankly, is the evolution in the field. Just as soon as you think you know something, boom, there's something else that pops up. And, you know, that's really what makes it fun, too. It's, it's evolving so rapidly now. 